we are honored to have you here, uh, Eric Starkov. Um, as Executive Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing, Eric Starkov leads worldwide sales and marketing organization, organizations responsible for driving focus, accountability, and growth. Since uh, joining uh, NI in 1997, Starkov has held leadership positions across the marketing organization, including um, um, leading t teams that pioneered industry, adoption of systems, platforms such as PXI and NI uh, Compact Rio. Starkov invests his uh, time in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM education in his community, serving on the advisory board for the Bradley Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, Virginia Tech, and the board of directors for Urban Roots, an Austin-based sustainable agricultural program to transfer the lives of young people. Uh, Starkov holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Virginia. Welcome. Okay, thank you, and good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome again to uh, Globecom 2015. Uh, this morning, I'm going to share with you an approach that is being used by uh, leading researchers around the world to go from uh, theory and concepts to actual real-world working prototypes for 5G systems faster than uh, ever before. I'm going to show you glimpses of technologies that are three to five years out from commercial adoption but that are being demonstrated uh, in the real world here and now. Now, before I start with that, though, I want to give a little bit of context to the revolution that's happening in the applications of wireless technologies that are necessitating the need for all this innovation uh, in the first place. So we're in the third era of telecommunications and connectivity technology. Uh, and it's really one that's going to change the nature of wireless communications pretty significantly. Uh, the first era started 140 years ago with the invention of wired telephony services. And that was really about connecting uh, places, connecting people's homes uh, and businesses. And the overall adoption of wired telephony services peaked actually not that long ago in 2003 with 1.2 uh, billion connections. And it's been in decline since then. And of course, it's been superseded by wireless uh, technology over the past couple of decades. But what's important to recognize is it's not just a transition from wired to wireless, but actually a major transition from connecting places to primarily connecting people. Uh, there are now over 7 billion mobile phones in the world, connecting almost uh, 4 billion of the world's uh, inhabitants. So quite a bit more than were ever connected by wired systems. And you know, one place where this is pretty evident, this transition from connecting places to connecting people, is in our uh, offices and the demise of the desk phone. You know, I actually had a, a, an interesting experience just a couple of weeks ago because we were going through in our office in Austin, we were going through the final transition away from our desk phones. And I couldn't help as I was walking down one of the aisles, I had to take this picture. Um, ironically enough, I took the picture with my smartphone, of course. But this is actually a trash bin just in unceremoniously heaped up with our desk phones as we move to purely mobile phones uh, and uh, Skype-based connections. And I really felt like I had to take a picture of it because it was such an important marker of a change in technology. Because here was a device that 20 years ago was the most important technology on our desk. And what's significant isn't just that we moved to a slightly, you know, kind of an updated version of the technology. But in fact, that the idea of having a connection to our desk uh, is no longer important. And the connection is to ourselves. And now, of course, we're in a similarly disruptive phase from connecting people to now connecting things. And it's been pretty well publicized that over the next decade or so, we expect to connect at least 10 times as many things uh, over wireless connections as we currently connect people. And so that really creates a sea change driver for the type of technology to serve that, that uh, uh, application. Here's another view of that sea change. And this is a view coming from the view of the data that's being generated from all of these smart connected systems. And it's been an explosion of data, and people have even compared it to the Cambrian explosion of evolution. 
Now, I'll forgive you if you're not up on your evolutionary history. I'll give you a quick primer. Uh, Cambrian explosion was about half a billion years ago, and that's when uh, there was a huge rise in the number of species we know from the fossil records, and it's credited with giving rise to much of the diversity and complexity of life as we know it. And it's actually a pretty good analogy because it's not just that we're creating more data, because this data isn't just from more people talking to people, it's from smart devices and diversity in the types of data that are being connected to our uh, networks with video and sensor data uh, from the world around us. What we're effectively doing, of course, is we are instrumenting the entire world with smart connected devices. And when we instrument or interface with the physical world, that's actually an infinite source of data. Right? The, the amount of data that we can get from the physical world is only limited by the number of uh, channels that we sample and how fast we sample them. And given the trends in sensing and semiconductor technology, of course, the trends are more sensors and sample them faster. And then with the incredible innovation that's been created from this community, we can now connect those systems uh, more ubiquitously and faster than uh, ever before through wireless. Now, when you read a lot of the popular press, it's as if we can just sprinkle the world with sensors and they connect to the cloud and it all just works. Uh, but I think we realize that a lot of the innovation that's happening is actually uh, often at the edge of these networks. The computation and the connectivity to meet the requirements of these emerging new applications. Now, we're going to put an intelligent uh, brain inside of every single device and we're going to um, essentially have that connect to and control the world around it and connect wire wirelessly with other systems. We think of that in areas like the smartphone, but it won't just be about the phone and other devices used to communicate between people. It'll be about things, and in particular, uh, industrial things. Things like uh, smart energy production systems, like windmills. Uh, things like smart uh, fleets for transportation. Smart grids uh, for our updating our power infrastructure and smart power plants as well. And of course, all of these different devices are going to be connected together in a system of systems that's often referred to as the industrial uh, internet of things. And it's important to recognize the difference, I think, in the type of requirements for these kind of applications above and beyond applications for uh, communication among uh, people. These Industrial Internet of Things applications have higher requirements for things like uh, the reliability. We'll talk about applications of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communi uh, communication and, uh, and smart industrial systems in a very high degree of reliability. They need uh, often much lower latency in machine-to-machine -machine applications. Again, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle for uh, collision avoidance doesn't do much good if you're a millisecond late. So the latency requirements are, are very difficult. Uh, enhanced security. And finally, upgradability. These systems need to be able to be upgraded over time because many of these kind of systems have a lifetime, a field lifetime, that's not measured in years, it's measured in, uh, in decades. And so you might be thinking, well, this is interesting. Hopefully you're thinking it's interesting. But you might also be thinking, you know, what does this have to do with 5G? I said I was going to talk about 5G. Well, the answer is this has everything to do with 5G because this is the set of applications uh, that are really driving a lot of the innovation that's required as we look forward to future uh, networking technologies in 5G. Here is uh, actually an image that was shared uh, uh, by uh, Nokia at a recent uh, RAN workshop on 5G. It's also principles that are in the uh, ITU uh, documents as well. And you can see that the bottom two parts of this triangle, in fact, are all about those industrial Internet of Things or machine-to-machine -machine applications. Low latency, ultra-reliability, and ubiquitous M2M or machine-to-machine -machine connectivity. It's the uh, innovation that this room and the larger industry is going to create that is absolutely required to make these um, applications real and to re realize the full potential of this Internet of Things. Now, we're also at a race on the convergence of these technologies into ultimately a global standard. 
And it's helpful uh, at times for perspective to look back at history and understand from uh, the past what we can learn from it. And so this is actually a map uh, from some documentation about the history of GSM and the process of standardization on GSM, which obviously was an incredibly successful standard, which really uh, ultimately changed uh, our industry. And so what happened is, in the early 80s, lots and lots of ideas were out there, and technologies were being explored and vetted and narrowed down into a set of candidate technologies that ultimately, in what this paper calls the pivotal year of 1987, were standardized into GSM. And from that point, then that technology got uh, designed into everything and into ultimately what became, you know, billions of compatible uh, devices around the world. And this is kind of the same uh, trajectory that will happen in 5G. And my estimate is that, you know, we're about here. So in the next couple of years, we're going to be rapidly converging on the set of technologies that will ultimately be the global standard and will create a huge opportunity to uh, uh, transform our organizations and transform society as a whole through a global standard uh, for addressing the applications I, I showed. So your ability to influence that standard is reaching its peak. And it becomes increasingly important in, that, in this time frame then, in this race to convergence, uh, that you have a way to vet through these ideas and prove them out and understand the viability of those ideas uh, as we move forward into solving these tough technical challenge. And how do you do that when obviously the clock is ticking? And how do we do that faster than we've been able to do it in the past? And one of the answers is through prototyping. As systems get more and more complex, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to characterize them fully in simulation and software. And increasingly, we need prototypes or test beds to assess the viability of these technologies and the interoperability of these technologies as candidates uh, for our future standards. Um, and this is noted here by uh, the National Science Foundation, the importance of these test beds. They're also important in convincing others of the viability of a particular technology. And I saw this actually firsthand uh, last spring. I was at the um, Brooklyn 5G Summit. And at that time, or prior to that time, I think there was a lot of skepticism around the use of millimeter wave for radio access for 5G. And shortly before that uh, conference in the spring, Samsung had done a, a demonstration on a uh, over-the-air link for millimeter wave. And then at the 5G Summit in 2014, uh, Nokia actually brought a millimeter wave a prototype that had a prototype base station communicating with a prototype uh, UE uh, and actually on millimeter wave frequencies and demonstrating uh, beam steering um, and, and, um, and beam tracking of the UE device. And I saw uh, during that time period really people's mind frame began to, began to shift and ramp up their own research into millimeter wave as a viable component for radio access for 5G systems. So, uh, and I've identified uh, four key vectors, millimeter wave is among them, of research areas of 5G that are in need of this kind of uh, prototyping capability to prove out technology and assess its viability. And those are um, massive MIMO, wireless network, areas like cloud-based RAN, software-defined networking, heterogeneous networks, uh, multi-radio access technology or multi-rat, and then as I mentioned, uh, millimeter wave. And an approach that can be very effective at assessing the viability of these uh, from a prototyping point of view is what is called a platform-based approach. And the concept of a platform-based approach is a unified design software that can go from early simulation through actually implementation of real-world systems to assess real-world performance and that software can be run on a variety of software-compatible, you know, off-the-shelf hardware. And this kind of approach is key to be able to speed the development of these kind of systems. And it's an idea that's actually based on research in multiple different domains. Uh, that hourglass shape that I chose for that slide is actually derived from work done by 
uh, Dr. Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli at UC Berkeley, uh, and also known often as the father of EDA. He's the co-founder of both Cadence um, uh, and Synopsis. And in this case, Alberto's hourglass is referring to ASIC development, right? And so he's doing uh, kind of mapping from an application space down through a set of consistent stack of system APIs, and then ultimately into a particular uh, implementation through an architectural space. And why is this important? Well, the reason it's important is that in this race to converging on the standard, we have to be able to shrink the development cycle going from an idea or a simulation to an actual prototype and ultimately a field trial. And today, we often have very disparate tools that are used across this flow. We usually start on the left side with a math tool and do early simulations. But when it comes time to doing a prototype of that system and assessing real world performance, we often rewrite those algorithms and design custom hardware to run them uh, to perform that prototype. We use that to uh, influence and debate elements of the standard. But then ultimately, when it comes time to do a field trial, again, we often have yet another system, a different kind of hardware architecture with different software used for that field trial. So we have to be able to shrink this cycle. And a way to shrink this cycle is to use a common platform across that starts with software used for uh, early simulation and design and has reuse of those algorithms onto both the prototypes and ultimately reuse of those algorithms in field trials as well. And I'm going to show you an, uh, actual examples of this uh, that are being done today, moving across this uh, chain here and saving months of calendar time, even a year or more of calendar time in getting to first prototype on some very, very sophisticated 5G systems. Now, of course, I'm talking because um, uh, NI has such a platform that is used for the prototyping of these systems and used to explore these different parts uh, or design vectors, or research vectors of 5G. And this platform is based on a standard uh, off-the-shelf graphical development environment that's used for algorithm exploration, but also the implementation of those algorithms on a set of software-compatible hardware devices for prototyping and trials of these kind of systems. Uh, it's used, in fact, on many different types of systems, and I'm going to show it applied specifically to the area of 5G research. Now, many of you probably think of National Instruments as a test and measurement company. And it's true, we are. We do uh, quite a bit of measurement. This platform is used for measurement systems going from DC through RF, and we're involved quite a bit on testing wireless systems in many of your company's validation labs and uh, production lines. But what I'm here to show you this morning is how this platform is actually used to build these real-time prototypes, how it's used to prototype algorithms and assess their performance uh, in under real-world uh, conditions. And I'm going to be doing that um, showing you a set of applications built around these common tools. And the centerpiece of these common tools is a software environment um, uh, called LabVIEW that m many of you might be familiar with. And in fact, at Globecom last year in Austin, after uh, many years of development, we released a version of LabVIEW targeted at this space called the LabVIEW Communication System Design Suite. And this software tool uh, is a hardware-aware environment that has uh, capabilities like high-level synthesis, like automated uh, float to fixed point uh, tools, um, and has the ability to target heterogeneous systems with processors and FPGAs from the same environment. Uh, it also comes with uh, IP, or has available IP, for physical layer reference designs for LTE and uh, YLAN that's a modular set of components so that you can pull out a piece to do algorithm exploration on a particular part of those standards and then have it run um, and, and build your prototype quickly with the existing components of the, of the Phi and the Mac. And then that software is compatible with a bunch of different hardware devices uh, that scale in performance, from universal software radio peripherals that can run on your desktop to very high-performance modular systems based on an industry standard called PXI that has a high-performance fabric on the backplane 
and integrated in ti uh, timing and synchronization. And so they can scale to very, very high performance systems and prototype things like millimeter wave um, UE devices and E-Node-Bs. And what's most important about this is each one of these devices is kind of a common architecture with processing and FPGA behind each node, and it is compatible from that uh, software. So software written for one of these devices can scale to any of them. Now we started really um, building out this capability in this space uh, back in 2010, and we started a wireless communications lead user program. Uh, we decided to work with some of the lead researchers in academia and in industry to help build out this capability and collaborate with them on these different research vectors. And so what I'm going to share here this morning, uh, this morning is some really cutting edge work being done by uh, these folks to really push forward some of these ideas in 5G. And each one of these examples that I'll show uh, is a demonstration of this concept of a platform-based approach. Because even though I'm going to show you many different uh, types of technologies, they're all built on this fundamentally same architecture for getting rapidly to a real-world prototype system. So I'm going to start on the left-hand side with um, Massive MIMO. And in fact, we just saw Massive MIMO applied to a satellite uh, system. So this is an area, obviously a very hot area that most of you probably have some familiarity with, where we're using hundreds or even thousands of antennas uh, to be able to increase the capacity and the utilization and the efficiency of wireless systems. Here's an example of a uh, test bed that's, being, uh, uh, that's been deployed by Lund University in Sweden for massive MIMO. So this system has 100 antenna nodes, and they're all operating coherently and adaptively uh, together. Uh, each one of those nodes has a processor and FPGA behind it. They're synchronized for coherent operation, and they have a, a very high bandwidth connection back to a centralized host that can carry 800 megabytes per second of, of data. And this system is being used to, again, to prototype different types of massive MIMO communication and immediately be able to assess the real-world performance of those different techniques and algorithms. Here's another example uh, in the MIMO space of Samsung doing a prototype on full dimensional or FD MIMO. This system is a 32 channel system, it's in a two dimensional array, so it can uh, exploit a three dimensional channel space. And uh, instead of just hearing me talk about it, I wanted to just show a quick uh, one minute video of uh, Dr. Farooq Khan and his team that demonstrated this system uh, just a couple of months ago. Samsung has been a leader in electronics and communications for decades. Most recently, we have been working with National Instruments on an ambitious plan to be first to market on innovative 5G solutions. Sure. Yeah. Using LTE IP as a starting point, we are proud to reveal the world's first live demonstration of a commercially viable FD MIMO prototype system. Awesome. We designed this uh, fully integrated FD MIMO base station with 32 antenna ports. In our lab, we were able to achieve an amazing three to five times capacity gain compared to existing LTE systems by using a large number of USRP reels as UE emulators. Here we're showing a demo with four USRP reels to emulate real 5G handsets. Yeah, as you can see, we have four stations here but have hard time to support all four users simultaneously because they are interfering with each other. However, by turning on the 3D beam forming, as you can see, the uh, throughput number increases from 0 to up to 30 megabps immediately, thanks to the using both horizontal 